The Lombard REC rally attracted literally millions of enthusiasts to some of the more remote parts of the countryside. To forest and mountain tracks, to racing circuits and to other tarmac stages, to watch the world's best drivers pushed to the very limit, displaying their considerable skills and nerve. There were in all 68 special stages, 450 competitive miles in the whole journey of nearly 2,000. In this, the final leg of the World Championship and the 50th RAC. They set out from York last Sunday, went down through the Midlands to Cheltenham, around Wales and back into England, completing the first circuit to York by Monday night. On Tuesday, they went north with an anti-clockwise run this time that took in the Scottish forests and down through the Lake District back to York. And then on Thursday, the final 10-hour loop around Yorkshire, completing it by mid-morning at the starting point. As Opal team leader Walter Rowell's Ascona 400 arrived for the pre-event scrutineering on Saturday, the newly crowned world champion was not in sight. And instead of co-driver Christian Geisdorfer, it was fellow German Gunter Wanger who was making a surprise appearance. What's happening then? Why are you signing in here? I don't know. They told me they changed that Jochi should drive Walter's car. Jochi Klein, he will come tonight and I'm the navigator from Jochi. We do it. Why? I don't know the reason why they said no to Walter. Well, he's never been very keen on this event because he can, he's never been able to practice it. He feels that it's uh, an event with a speciality towards the Finns and the Scandinavians. And uh, obviously his heart was not in it. We want the maximum performance we can from every single member of our team. And we decided at the last minute to substitute Kleint for Earl. Kleint is the, um, the other German uh, age seeded driver. He needs to have a good result now, this year, to actually retain his age seeding. And we think that he'll be hungry enough now, as this is his last chance, to do an actual better performance than Walter Earl. And have you told Walter he's not driving then? Oh yes, we discussed it over his egg this morning. I just get one hour before the information from my chief that I'm free, I can go home. And I think uh, what maybe also uh, sure, if you are already a world champion, you are not motivated like you fight for a world champion. And my team is afraid that maybe I am not enough motivated and it's better to, to send me home and of course I respect it and I'm very happy about this one. So Jockey, are, are you as surprised to be here as we are surprised to see you? Yeah, I didn't know that man, I know it yesterday morning and uh, I'm driving now here to the RSC rally. Are you looking forward to it? Yes, yeah. What do you know about the RSC at such short notice? So? You know, it's a very difficult rally, it's made out pace notes and I didn't do it quite often here yeah. and I do my best. But what makes this one of your favorite rallies, Henning? There's no practice and, uh, you know, uh, roads are very difficult and, uh, and also competition makes it so good. Well, where's the main competition going to come from? I think from Opel and uh, also we have uh, Alain in Lancia and, uh, and Plunkvist in Talbot, so it will be hard, hard rally. Does the fact that there's no pace notes worry you, Michelle? On no, not at all, because uh, uh, I like it. It's a pleasure to be alone with your car and never know where you are going and just to try to, to go fast, you know. This I like it very much. In today's rallying, except for rallies like Safari and, and uh, Ivory Coast, you really go flat out from the start. There are some areas in, in RAC, some areas in Wales and in, uh, in Kilda Forest where you have to take it a bit easier, where you have to take it sensibly, and of course that is difficult for me. The, let's say so that I will try to keep it cool uh, these uh, first first the spectator stages, and and then it depends on you know from the gap between the with the other drivers. If if I'm close, then I maybe I don't make any big attack yet, but uh, I want to get to kill the stages with the good car because I I like that stages. I like them very much because the other the, the other drivers doesn't like it, so it's a big advantage to me. Well, I'd like to think that the British drivers could come to the fore. Certainly we've got a few British drivers in good cars this year, which is the point that matters. We've got Jimmy in the Opal, myself in the Vauxhall, and Terry KB and Russell Brooks. So there are some guys there with decent machinery, which is the first requirement. I'll be watching closely over the next three or four days. Good, good luck, good. Tony. All the very Thanks. best. Bye now. Bye bye. You mustn't shut down the door. Good luck. I enjoyed it last year in Chester. I'm back again this year in York. And this, of course, is a famous occasion. It's the 50th anniversary of the Lombard RAC rally, so uh, I'm delighted to be here, hoping that Britain's going to do well in it. 
you think they are? I think so. I've just been talking to Tony Pond, just as you were. He's looking very confident, but you do need a tremendous amount of good luck in this sort of event, and uh, you've got to be fit and strong, and Tony's looking fit and strong, I thought. The Minister for Sport, Neil McFarlane, braved the pouring rain at York Castle to wave away last year's winner, Hannu Mikola, the obvious favourite to take a record fourth victory on this gruelling final round of the World Rally Championship. His quattro was leading a massive six-car Audi team in a bid to take victory in the World Championship for makes. On the first special stages of Bramham Park, Clumber and Sutton Park, the pattern was set for five days of rallying in treacherously slippery conditions. Season-long rivals Opel responded to the challenge by including ex-world champion Ari Vatanen in their four-car lineup. Marco Allen was giving the new Lancia supercar its British international debut and soon gave notice that he would threaten the might of the Audis. The big question was, would the new car stand the pace? Substitute driver Jockey Kleit made a steady start, but the Opel gamble soon came unstuck. At the end of the first day, Kleit fell foul of the slippery conditions and his car went off the road, out of the event, reducing the Opel team to just three cars. Leading lady driver Michel Mouton, runner-up in the Drivers' World Championship, soon adapted to the wet conditions. Talbot team leader Stig Blomqvist was driving the Sunbeam Lotus on its last official event and hoping to repeat the car's victory on the Lombard REC rally two years ago when it was driven by Henry Toivonen, who this year is the third member of the Rothmans Opel team. Britain's leading hope, Tony Pond, driving the Vauxhall Chevette for the first time this year, needed all the good fortune that the Minister for Sport had wished him only a few hours earlier. But his luck was about to desert him. Although he recovers this time, a more serious spin in the Forest of Dean soon forced him out of the rally. Penty Auricola was making a welcome return to the British scene with a Colt Lancer Turbo, surprisingly matching Mikola's early pace. Frenchman Guy Frecolat was in the second Talbot Sunbeam Lotus. He finished third in 1980, reveling in similar conditions. But uh, this year he had a new navigator, Jean-Francois Fauchille. With the rain coming down still harder, Russell Brooks in the second Vauxhall Chevette was putting on a splendid show for the hundreds of thousands of spectators who were undeterred by the atrocious conditions. His co-driver was travel agent Mike Broad. Third member of the Vauxhall team was Toaster's Terry Cabey, who held a fabulous second place as the cars headed south towards Wales. The battle was on. Three, two,
Joining in the battle of the factory teams were the two Dockham's Toyotas, fresh from their successes in New Zealand and the Ivory Coast. But Japanese rivals Mitsubishi Colt soon lost Pantier Ricola when he crashed the car, wrecking the front suspension. Brooks was slowed by transmission problems, but his service crew changed a complete gearbox in less than 15 minutes. Other teams have more obvious problems. The Toyota of Sweden's Bjorn Valdegard arrives at the service point in Starport on 7, looking somewhat the worse for wear. Check that woman, then. Bjorn, what, what happened? Uh, certain part was too slippery. What did you do? What did that uh, happen? I just slide off into the grass and hit the tree. No serious damage, it's just bodywork, is it? No, 45 seconds, that's the most important. We had a little excursion on the second stage. Um, I think John Buffum hit the same tree as well, so we're in company. The average speed are Did it lose you much time? No, very little, really, Barry. Very little, but it's very, very slippery. And where are we just making the stages on time? No damage? Uh, just a little bit of damage to this, the co driver side, as usual. Yeah. Just to keep him awake. By Monday morning in mid Wales, Mikola's brilliant driving has taken him 30 seconds ahead of fellow countryman Ari Vatanen, who was using all his mastery to keep his Ascona in contention for an outright victory. The only result that could earn Opel the manufacturer's championship. Backing up Mikola in the second Audi Quattro is Michel Mouton. She's in fifth place, just behind Teuvelin's Opel, with the young Finn starting his attack. The rocky Welsh stages have caused problems for many drivers, and this is Teuvelin's second time-consuming puncture on the Coy de Brunin stage, just south of Bettisakoy. Per Eklund's Toyota is making steady progress in 11th place. While Brooks is going faster in the Vauxhall at the expense of the bodywork. Fellow Vauxhall driver Terry Cavey is another to be slowed by punctures. Stig Blockfist is the leading Talbot driver, holding eighth position. German national champion Harold DeMuth, with British co-driver John Daniels, is impressive in sixth. As the cars reach North Wales, a second blow hits the Rothmans Opel team. Vatanen's car lies abandoned outside the local village school. Well, we went off in Klakanuk forest and uh, damaged the radiator and head casket went immediately and that's it. End of this rally. Mikola forges ahead in a most impressive and determined manner. Now it's Teuvelin's turn to take up the Opel challenge. But yet again, bad luck strikes the young Finn, though despite another puncture, he is still up to third. Alain's Lancia is back to fourth. is still moving up the top ten. Voldegaard's Toyota is one place behind Brooks. 
The surviving Colt Lancer Turbo, driven by Swede Anders Kulang, is making up for lost time after hitting some logs. Opal team car, driven by Jimmy McRae and Ian Grindrod, is well down the field and eventually retires without making an impression. After a promising start, KB has slipped out of the top ten. Leading Talbot driver Stig Blomqvist is in aggressive mood, but tries a little too hard. Fortunately, the camera crew recover quicker than the Swede. This spin had dropped him five places to 14th by the time the cars arrived back in York for the overnight halt. Mikola's lead, an impressive four minutes. You were having a bit of a struggle with Marco earlier on in the night, weren't you? Yeah, we had it. Uh, we, we, we didn't get his times at the beginning and we didn't realize how fast he was driving. So it was quite a surprise. So when you did find, you were able to... Yeah, then we had to speed it up, of course. Uh, Without any trouble. No, you know, Marco was driving very well, so it wasn't such a clear thing at all. But uh, at the beginning, it, it looked that uh, he will just disappear. I have a little bit problem, you know, this electric distribution talk, but maybe now I everything okay. Tomorrow I possibly like go go. So how far behind is Marco? <coughs> Thirty-eight, I think. Thirty-eight. And are you keeping ahead of him? Uh, well, we have done more or less the same time, so. When we come to Kilder, which is my favorite stage, is and Marcus, uh, Marco hates them, so I hope that that advantage for me will be, you know, ma uh, enough. Well, yesterday it was very good because I enjoyed it very much, and this night it was very, very long night, and uh, I was tired, really tired. And also the engine was not perfect because we have some problem with the uh, injection and turbo pressure. So we have not all power, and... Uh, it was not like I would like, you know, to... But in every case, I, I try to, to go. Are they going to be able to fix it for you? Ah, it's okay. We, we have changed now in the last... Uh, before the last stage, we have changed the injection system, and so now it's okay. On the, on the last stage, it was okay, was it? Yeah, yes, it was okay, but I was so tired, you know. <laughs> you can start enjoying it again tomorrow? I hope so, yes. By day, it's fa fantastic. I prefer by day than by night. Tuesday morning, and it's still raining. The ford in Hamsterley Forest is deeper than ever, but it doesn't deter Mikola. DeMuth's splendid drive has pushed him to second place ahead of Toivonen. Alain is fourth, and with a two-litre supercharged engine repaired, he is mounting a big attack on the leaders. Michel Mouton and Italian co-driver Fabrizio Pons, with their engine once again on song, are also back in the chase. is six at the start of the second leg on the rallycross circuit at Croft. Baldegard is seventh. Blomquist, recovering from his setback, is soon back to ninth. Baldegard's Swedish teammate Per Eklund is also well in touch. Nicola bounces off the wall at Witten Castle in a desperate attempt to stay with the leaders. Meanwhile, back in Hampstonley, Cumbria's Malcolm Wilson at the wheel of the left-hand drive Audi Quattro is steadily moving up the field, co-driven by journalist Mike Greasley. Kulang's Colt Lancer has had a troubled run, and this puncture is soon followed by clutch failure, pulling him out of the rally.
John Weatherly's Citroen Visa was leading its class as the cars headed for the infamous Kielder Forest and the rally's longest night. Five, four, three, two, one, one. Dawn in the Lake District and the rain has stopped at last. Mikola has dominated the night to extend his lead to five minutes, leaving a trail of carnage behind him. KB's Vauxhall is about to join the list. In Grisdale Forest, that telltale blue smoke signifies the end of a valiant effort by the British youngster. By the time the survivors reach Harewood Hill Climb, the sun is actually shining, and the crowds have flocked in their thousands to watch the cars before their return to York and the final leg of the event. Toivonen is almost six minutes behind the leading Audi, and threatened by an ever-improving Michel Mouton less than one minute behind. Alain is still fourth, but his challenge is fading. Three minutes behind the French girl, despite a spirited effort on this famous hill climb. DeMuth's startling drive has been spoilt when he slipped off the road in the Lake District, dropping him to sixth. Baldegard is still a comfortable seventh. The ever-improving Malcolm Wilson is now up to 10th. While Frecolin is 11th, as the drivers take a few hours rest before the final night of the rally in the daunting Yorkshire forests. Five, four, three, two, one, go! The big question is, can Toivonen stay ahead of a determined Michelle Mouton in her Audi Quattro? Five, four, three, two, one, go! Marco Allen will be happy with fourth. Harold Demuth, fifth. Top Bridge, Russell Brooks, sixth. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Bjorn Valdegard, an excellent seventh in the Duckham's Toyota, with teammate Eklund ninth. One, go! Four, three, two, one, go! Wilson takes tenth. The final special stage of the rally at Oliver's Mount in Scarborough. Mikola's win is assured. And Michel Mouton has caught and passed Toivonen during the night. The superior traction of the Audi Quattro in the Yorkshire Forest has given her an 11-second advantage over Toivonen, who makes a last desperate bid on this tarmac stage to regain his place, but to no avail. Back in York, Hannu Mikola has scored a tremendous victory and set a new record with his fourth win on the Lombard RAC Rally. It's a tremendous achievement after 450 miles of the toughest rally stages in the world. Co-driver Arnie Head celebrates an impressive record too, with five wins in the co-driver's seat. And this victory confirms Audi as winners of the 1982 World Rally Championship. Very heavily wooded.